good evening everybody so welcome uh, to my talk about quantum computing um, happy to see you with so many still at this late hour for a topic which is quite challenging so i'm eric atwar i'm in fact part of the ibm company in the ibm cloud unit and in my regular day-to-day -day job, I'm covering the, the IBM Bluemix Cloud Platform. So I'm not part of the, the quantum research department or something like that. So this is just one of my hobbies. Um, and, and that's why I'm going to explain you a little bit uh, what, what you can do with this IBM quantum computer. Because that's actually what it is. IBM provides a quantum computer which is hooked up in the cloud, which you uh, will be able to use uh, for your own experiments. And so we first will introduce you a little bit. What is it? What is this IBM quantum experience? Um, what's the purpose? Why do we do this? Um, and then we will dive into it and we will uh, look at how you can use it. Um, the main tool which you will be using is this quantum composer. Um, so we will look at that. I will also try to do some demonstrations uh, of how it works. And um, one of the things is I've already posted my slides on uh, SlideShare so, and, and I've tweeted the link. So if you want to look at the, the presentation contains quite a few links to where you find this quantum composer, etc. So if you want to play with the things, uh, you can download the presentation and then you have all the, all the links. So once we've introduced the, the quantum composer, we will start to look at what can you actually do with it? What are the uh, basic building blocks? And for anybody who already seen some introduction, because we will not be able to do a, a full overview of what is quantum computing, of course, here we will mostly focus on how you can use it. I will try to explain a few uh, things for those who are not familiar with, with quantum computing. But so we will first look at the basic building blocks. What is at your disposition in this composer? And then the next step will be uh, to look at um, some algorithms. How can you really do something and, and, and get some things going? And then as a last part, I will discuss a little bit about quantum error correction, which we will see is quite an important uh, subject and is also one of the things which over the years uh, at, I, at the IBM research labs they, they, they got more and more control on which makes uh, the quantum computing really usable. And then as a last piece I've included a number of slides with lots of reference information. I will also explain a little bit what it is um, because there is quite some good information both at IBM and uh, at some other sources. So first of all, an introduction to this IBM quantum experience. So to, to begin with, let's first take a look at why do we think quantum computing is important? Why do we need it? Why are we not just continuing like we did? <coughs> Sorry, and probably everybody already realized that over the last few years, you saw this exponential growth in computing power no longer happening. Um, if I remember a few years ago, I also had a CPU which was at uh, somewhere between 2 and 3 gigahertz and it's not moving anymore at that pace which we were seeing like 10 years ago. And that's basically the point. We are coming to this end of the Moore's law and, 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 and the, 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 the increase of those traditional computing models. Actually, the, the, the typical um, um, microchips we are currently building are at the point that 
a transistor is only a few atoms, so we cannot no, no longer go much further in, in those kind of models. And still there is a lot of problems where we want huge computing power. If you uh, paid some attention at the conference, um, you probably heard a lot about all those machine learning, deep learning, etc. And each of those things, it requires quite some power, especially if you would want to apply it in, in, in real time. So, so, so we, we need more computing power for certain, for solving certain problems. So how can we do that? And one of the, the possible solutions we see at IBM is quantum computing. I mentioned a few other uh, things which we are doing in our research labs. One of the other uh, things we are, we are looking at is so-called approximate computing. What's the idea there? The idea is that one of the most costly operations in our traditional computers is uh, processing real numbers um, and, and, and making calculations with lots of digits uh, behind the comma. That is what is costing a lot and for which we use things like those uh, graphical processor units and, and, and all those kind of things. But in some solving some problems, you might not need all that precision. So we are looking at some computing models where you would do some approximate calculations um, and then it's a bit too simplified here. 10 times 10 is 98 is of course not what we are looking at, but it's more like in some cases, for example, calculating those neural networks and things like that, it might be enough if we calculate with less digits, less precision, which of course can then also save a lot on the, on the computing power. So that's one, one area we are looking at. Another um, area is so-called uh, neuromorphic computing, so a computing model based on the actual or at least on the model how we think that uh, neurons, human neurons work and that of course has also some good links to all those neural networks and, and so on. So one of the, um, the and, and actually we already have some of those processors available and actually one of the, the things we are doing with that is uh, image recognition. And one of the big advantages of that solution is that it's, it's quick and it consumes little power. So you can do real-time um, image recognition in small kind of devices. Yeah. So, so that's some other computing models. The one which we're going to look into is quantum computing because that's one of the other possibilities where we see uh, that there might be uh, some some uh, advantages in in the future now what what might be possible applications of quantum computing so a first case which pops up a lot when people talk about quantum computing is um, cryptography so most of our today's cryptography algorithms are based on these large prime numbers which are difficult to calculate and which would if you would do it with tra traditional computers would cost you a lot of energy and a lot of time so it's basically not feasible and that's why our uh, cryptography is, is working today so one of the things which you might be able to do with with quantum computers is do these prime factoring uh, algorithms much more quickly, which would of course mean a lot of things, a lot of changes from a viewpoint of cryptography and cryptographic algorithms. The thing is that it, on the one hand, it might um, might bring some um, possibilities to break certain of our today's algorithms. It will also open so up some new possibilities to do more powerful uh, cryptography or more powerful ways to exchange keys and, and, and things like that, which is one of the big problems in uh, today's cryptography. 
Now, that's only one of the possible uh, cases. What we, what, we also, um, what we also think could be a good possibility is research into uh, the behavior of molecules. One of the, the things that we know is that a lot of the things that happen within a, a mo molecule are actually quantum-based kind of effects. So today, trying to simulate those molecules with a normal kind of computer is, is too complex. We can only do very simple molecules. Maybe we can do things like a water mo molecule, but already a molecule like caffeine or is, is way too complex to be able to completely simulate it with a traditional computer. Now, if we would have a quantum computer which is based on those quantum effects, we would most probably be able uh, to do such kind of simulations, which can have all kinds of advances with regards to, for example, research towards new medicine, new drugs, um, or new kind of materials. So, so that's another domain where we think uh, this is going to become important. As I already mentioned, another domain uh, where lots of computing power is, is needed is this machine learning. For example, uh, yesterday um, I was at the session uh, by some of my colleagues on the, 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 the networks behind the Watson computing. One of the questions that was asked was, why is it that a child can watch a movie for maybe 10 minutes and learn a lot of things out of that. And if you want to learn or train some of those uh, neural networks, you have to send in lots and lots of hours of material before it becomes a bit effective. So the, 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 the problem there is also, of course, that a lot of those calculations and, and the, the learning, the deep learning, takes a lot of computing power. So it might also be, uh, quantum computing might also be a solution for those kind of things. And then the last thing, actually a point which we're going to see one example or a basic example of it, is the fact that we can improve some of the search algorithms. So we would be able uh, to perform certain search in large volumes of data, quicker, which of course everybody knows is uh, a problem we encounter a lot in, in today's world. So, so these are some of the domains where we think quantum computing can become important, where it can mean, mean really something. And that's of course why we are performing the research in it, and on the other hand why we think it's important that the world l starts to learn about uh, quantum computing. And, and, and that's actually the whole reason why we are doing this quantum computing in the cloud and, and so on, is to help people in getting an understanding, learning how you can program these things, uh, etc. Now, if we dive in, just for those who are not so familiar, what, what is quantum computing about? So quantum computing is using some of the principles of um, uh, physics, quantum physics, um, and uh, actually it's based on the usage of something which we call qubits, which actually are um, some are very similar to regular bits in, in traditional computing, with one very big difference, the fact that they no, not only can be zero or one, but that they can also be this, all the states in between those, which is actually what we call the, the superposition. Yeah. And that will be the basis of a lot of the, the reasons why you can do certain things quickly with quantum computing, because you will be able to pass just with a few qubits could repre potentially represent a lot of information, and as such, you uh, can do uh, certain things very quickly. Now, that's a bit too simplified because there are some other things which you will have to take into account. 
one of the big problems, and we will also see that when we start to look at the, the algorithms, is that as soon as you try to observe those qubits, as, as soon as you try to measure them, they will flip either to the zero or the one state. Yeah? So that will make it very difficult to make use, and that will be also the challenge when you devise the algorithms, is how can I get beyond that? And that's actually what we're going to do with the entanglement. In fact, the entanglement will mean that if you have multiple qubits, there can be certain effects from one to the other, and you could, by measuring one qubit, get some information about certain other qubits. As such, not destroying the superposition on uh, those qubits which are, which, with which you are treating the information. So that, that's, in a few words, what is, what is quantum computing. Now, how do we make, in fact, to, to, to create a quantum computer, you need to create those qubits, those qubits which show those kind of effects which uh, obey to those laws of uh, quantum mechanics. And that's actually where IBM succeeded in doing this in a relatively usable form factor. And we will immediately see what, what I mean with that. So we, we succeeded, and here is actually an image, and this is no longer the image of what we are using today. It's what we uh, devised in uh, 2015. So this is actually a chip with four qubits. Now, um, what, what is it, what is it uh, based on? In fact, we will see that it's based on some oscillators, and I will immediately explain a little bit more about those and why those can be used. And we will be able to put certain frequencies on it and then also measure uh, certain readouts out of them, which will tell you uh, what kind of state uh, those, those qubits uh, are in. Yeah. And actually a few more information, so you see the black, um, the black uh, stripe here is basically 100 uh, micrometers, uh, so it's showing you kind of the size of these, uh, of these kind of things. And actually the, the piece here is one of the qubits uh, which is enlarged. If you want to know more about how these qubits actually work and, and, and are implemented, I, I mentioned here uh, one of the articles, so that's one of the articles which our research people uh, brought out when they first devised uh, that kind of uh, qubit uh, design. Now, to explain a little bit more what this qubit this design is about. Um, I have here um, some some diagrams uh, with which you, I can exp or try to explain a few things. And the first thing is those are based on an oscillator. And for those of you who maybe in their past experimented with building radio circuits, they probably know this kind of 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 construct which allows you to, for example, create uh, a certain frequency filter. Um, in, in, in most basic radios, you were using this, so um, an, an induction and a capacitor to, um, to create a filter. And then in most cases, those capaci the capacitor was one which you could tune so where you could change the capacity and as such modify the filter and filter out a, a particular frequency. So now such an oscillator basically um, gives you the possibility to create certain frequencies and those correspond also to energy levels. Now the problem with such a basic oscillator is that they are all the same, so it's not possible to 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 make any difference in measurements between all those various levels. Now that is where, if we add 
a Johnson junction, which is actually a very tiny um, 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 silicium construct, which will be operated at very low um, temperatures where some superconduction uh, effects are starting to appear. If we add that to the circuit, we will see some other effects happening. In fact, we will see that the energy levels will all be different. And as such, we will be able to distinguish between all those states, allowing us to create a basic kind of qubit. So, so, so this is kind of the basis of uh, what uh, we are putting in there. So already a first remark you might have heard, it's based on some superconductivity at very low temperature, which of course makes it um, not so easy to take some of those qubits and put them here on the table, for example. So how did we get from that those qubits to a quantum computer. So actually, this is a photograph of the current design. And the big difference is that now there is five qubits in there. Uh, so the principles are still the same, but there is five qubits in there. And there is some important thing also to note when you're going to start to build algorithms is that actually the second qubit here is kind of connected with all the others, which will play a role when we will start to play with the entanglement and the multi-qubit uh, gates. So, so that will be, have some impact, and we will see that also later when you start to build the, the algorithms. Yeah. Now, how do we go from that uh, qubit to a quantum computer? So I have a few images. So we add a lot of wires to attach all those measure oscillators to f frequency generators and then also measurements. We put that in some cooling um, environment so which we can cool with some liquid helium. And then basically it becomes this kind of thing. Yeah. So. Um, so that's the, the, the photograph of the actual quantum computer that you can use. Yeah. Now, what I have here is an, an, a, a, a short demonstration of how it looks like in this lab. Uh, so I will uh, start to play the, the movie. Welcome to the IBM Research Quantum Computing Lab. In this lab, scientists are building a quantum computer inspired by nature and the laws of quantum mechanics. This computer could exponentially speed up computing and solve challenges that are out of the reach of today's computers. Take a look around. Explore IBM's quantum computing efforts. So, and, and actually here you see one of the scientists mounting some of the resonators before the thing gets closed up, etc. Uh, you see here also all the, the pumps and valves that are controlling uh, the, 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 the liquid helium cooling, uh, etc. And then of course some control um, apparatus which, which, which you use to uh, calibrate and, 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 and to, to access uh, the, the whole thing. And actually, you, I've also uh, added the link. In fact, you can, uh, this movie is actually, if you look at it on YouTube, you will see it's at 360 degrees. Here it's flattened out. Uh, but on, on YouTube, you see it in 360 degrees, and you can kind of walk uh, through this, uh, uh, this, this, this lab. So what is now the, the nice thing is that actually this whole setup, you can use it, for example, from a tablet or just a web browser uh, with this composer, which we will be looking into. Uh, so, 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 so that's kind of the amazing thing. You have this uh, huge device uh, being cooled uh, at uh, almost the absolute uh, zero uh, degrees. Um, 
and you can control it, you can submit experiments from it, from uh, the cloud, from, from a web browser, using whatever kind of device uh, you want. So, so that was the introduction. What, what is there? What, what can you do? Uh, what, 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 what is at your disposition? What we're going to look now into is a bit more this quantum composer. So, how does, how can we really do something with it? And the, again, a link that this is the link where you can get access to it. You can just um, create a free account there. And uh, you can get uh, you can get going uh, and access both a simulator and a real quantum computer. And we will immediately also explain what is the differences when we uh, start to look on it. The real quantum computer, you will have some credits to use it. And basically, the more experiments you do, you will get some additional credits. So if people, if the the, the the lab people see that you do some reasonable things with it, you will be able to do more uh, with it. So this is um, just a screenshot of the, of the composer. And actually what I propose is to look at it in real life, because that's always uh, much more fun. So... Uh, So actually, um, I, the link was pointing to the place where you immediately create a new uh, experiment. Uh, so I have to give it the name. And then the first um, choice I have to make is ideal quantum computer or real quantum processor. And w what's the difference? In fact, it's mentioned there the, um, the ideal quantum computer in an ideal quantum computer, which you will only be able to use with the simulator, all qubits are equal. In the real quantum com processor setup, it will take into account the actual um, the actual setup and the actual layout of those qubits, uh, the, the five qubit uh, processor. So if we select that, so now we get this composer, and so then. Uh, there is a few interesting things which I can see. So here, first of all, I can see that the actual device is active. At some points in time, they perform maintenance on it. So then the actual device is not active. The way it works, typically, if you submit experiments to the real quantum computer, they go into a queue and they will be executed uh, at a certain point in time. And then you get back the results. Um, on the simulator, obviously, you can immediately uh, execute. Next, you see also some of the calibration values. So, for example, you see the fridge temperature there. So, it's pretty cold in there. Um, so, so, you see that. And then we also see some calibration values of the, the various qubits. And we will come back to that when we uh, look into the error correction. Uh, but those timings are basically uh, based on the decay time. So how long will a qubit keep its value? And that's one of the big difficulties in all quantum computing. Now, let's just do something very simple uh, just to, to show how it can be used. So um, what I have here is a number of quantum gates, and we will immediately look into what those are and explain a little bit more uh, what they are. But for those of you who have already had some exposure to quantum computing, these should be uh, no strangers. So we have some quantum gates, which we can just drag and drop and add to these lines. And then we can also uh, add some measurements. So um, very simple. So this actually this X operation is corresponding to a, a, a bit flip or an XOR operation. So uh, or, or an, 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 a not operation. Sorry, not operation. So uh, we will um, actually by executing this one, uh, we will be able to see 
uh, what's happening. First remark, you see here those zeros, actually all the qubits will be initialized for you in the zero state. So if I now uh, perform a simulation, I again get two options, ideal quantum processor or realistic quantum processor. In fact, what's the difference? This one will just apply the maths without including any of the error effects. The realistic quantum processor as a simulator will actually uh, perform the, the, the same kind of thing but including some of the error effects. So you will see that uh, certain errors start to appear. So let's now execute this. So what, what do I get here? In fact, um, I get some representations of the measurement. So the first thing is what we see is that the output of this, um, this experiment m returns me a one, which is the, uh, the, the, the result of um, actually this, this uh, not operation. But you see here that there is a still a slight um, peak here at the zero. Why is that? Because we took the realistic quantum computer, so there is some errors. And this is also what you would see if you execute it on the real quantum uh, computer. The, gl the, the, the globe present representation is just representing uh, the, those values because now the graph here is still quite simple because we are only working with one qubit one measurement, so there is only two possible values that we can see. Um, if you work with more qubits, you're obviously going to get more uh, values here. And then it becomes sometimes easier to look at the results uh, in this uh, quantum sphere representation, where actually, uh, in this case, the, um, the, the zero value is represented here and the one is represented there. So you can, in the composer, you can also run your experiment. So if you would do that, you can uh, choose how many times you want to execute the experiment. Um, and depending on what you choose, you will uh, pay a certain un number of units. One of the nice things is also that for many experiments that people have already been using, you can also obtain results from the cache. So then you don't have to specify, uh, spend your units. So for example, for this very simple experiment, I can get some results which are in the cache. I can see from what kind of dates when those were executed. And I can get uh, as such also what is happening with a real quantum computer. And you see here, there is even a bit more of an error in, in the execution. So that was a, a first kind of look at, at this uh, composer. Um, let's now look a little bit further uh, to see what uh, you can do for real. Yeah. So a first kind of thing is there is all these gates and what, what are they about just quickly because again if we would explain that we are explaining the whole theory of quantum uh, computing. So you will have these yellow gates which are basically just weights. So they are just weights and we will see those will allow you to experience, for example, some of the quantum errors. So you will be able to insert those in the, uh, in the circuit and you will see that the, um, the errors will, 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 will increase. Then there is uh, three green gates which are basically known as the Pauli gates, uh, which we will immediately also see a little bit more what they are represented by mathematically. But basically those are rotations around multiple kind of axes. And um, we will immediately also introduce a little bit why it comes that this is actually being represented as a three-dimensional uh, vector space. There is some more gates. One of the very important ones is this Hadamard gate. Why? Because that Hadamard gate will be one of the gates that will allow us to create superpositions. So we've seen in our first experiment, 
the qubit was initialized on the zero value and we just used this Pauli X gate to uh, perform a bit flip which would bring it in the, in the state one. Now, if we want to start to use the power of quantum computing, we will need to make use of the superpositions and in many cases that will involve those Hadamard gates. Um, so they will be fairly important. And there is some of the other uh, related gates, uh, so some phase gates, what will those do? They will do a phase rotation, um, so they will also be uh, important uh, in, in those superpositions. One special gate will be a gate that is a controlled gate, so it will be multiple. It will use multiple qubits, so it will start to use the interference between uh, qubits, and that will be very important in many of our constructions of the algorithms. And then, of course, uh, there, there is some more, but we will cover them later on. And then there is also some measurement gates because those will allow us uh, to observe what is, what is happening. Yeah. So, first important remark, which we already made when we, uh, when we looked at the, the real-life demo, so you, the, the real um, quantum computer takes into account some of the circuit design. So you will, for example, notice that when you do the real quantum computer, you can only do this controlled NOT gate between the qubit 2 and the other qubits. In, a, in an ideal um, uh, quantum computer, all the qubits will be equal and you will be able to do the controlled NOT between any of the, of the lines. So that will be a difference and it's just based on the, 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 the physical factors of the, of the circuit that we are using to implement the, the five qubit uh, computer. Now here is another example. Um, it's basically a random generator and I'm not going to try to explain here in a few moments the experiment, but just uh, let me show a little bit uh, what it actually does. And it allows me also to show you um, a little bit more about what is another important part of this quantum experience is actually there is a whole guide explaining uh, about quantum computing and giving you all these kind of samples. So uh, why is that important? Because we put this out on the web for people to be able to learn about quantum computing. So there is also a lot of material there. And uh, the, the examples, so here we have this random generator. We can just open them up in the composer and then we can, for example, um, uh, run them or simulate them and here you see we don't have a run why because this one has been created for ideal uh, quantum processor meaning that for example i can do these kind of things these uh, controlled not gates between uh, qubits which are not the q2 qubit and on a real one i would not be able to do that so Simulating that, in fact, uh, what it will do is it will generate one of four random uh, values. And we see that in this graph, so they are with equal probability. And uh, we can also see it on this, uh, on this graph, you see those values being uh, represented. Wait, let, let me go back to the... Yeah, so in fact those are corresponding, I have it in the slides also, but those are corresponding to the zero, 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 so the top of the sphere is actually the, the 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 all zero values, and then it it goes down like this. So it allows us in this much more compact view to show uh, all the the different values, and then they also try to illustrate with these uh, lines, which are not always 
that easy to interpret uh, the, um, the probability. So the lines towards those dots will become thicker or thinner depending on the probability. So now the lines are all the same thickness because it's equal probabilities. So going back uh, to the, the um, to the presentation, um, so so this is just a slide showing the, the result. So we can skip that. Let's now look a little bit more at what are all those gates, what are what are those building blocks, and and how we can use them. Yeah. So first of all, important is the the qubits. They will be vectors in a complex Hilbert space, which actually means. Uh, that um, you can represent the coordinates of that space with the qubit 0 and qubit 1. And all the values, all the possible values for qubit state can be represented by a coefficient, for example, alpha times the, the 0 qubit plus i, which is the, the, the square root of minus 1, times the... Um, uh, times a, a factor, for example, beta uh, times the, uh, the the one qubit. Uh, so, so that is how you can represent from a mathematical viewpoint uh, those 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 qubit uh, states, and so the zero and the one uh, correspond to these kind of vectors. And the operators are actually it's possible to represent them with some uh, matrices and. Uh, the um, a lot of the operations are in fact linear algebra uh, calculations, and here we have the representations of the uh, poly operation operators, the x, y, and z. So if you want to calculate what the uh, the x will do on, for example, the zero uh, qubit, which is what we did in the experiment, you basically multiply uh, this uh, matrix with that vector. Uh, and for those of you who still remember some of their linear algebra, you will see that the result would be the zero one. So it would be the flip and actually performing the same, multiplying the x with the one uh, qubit, it would result in this. Yeah. So um, the other operations are actually involving, in this case, some complex, and that's also why we call them phase uh, uh, flips because they will not just flip from uh, the, the zero to one state, but they will also perform some uh, rotations. Now, the next step is the superposition because that one is very important with those basic poly operations. Okay, you can do some things, you can flip and you can uh, change the phase, but it would not yet allow you to make use of the power of quantum computer because that's based on the superposition. So what, what can we do with the, how can we do that? We can use this Hadamard gate. What will the Hadamard gate do? It actually is represented by this matrix here and actually it will turn the cube, uh, um, the zero qubit into this plus state, which is actually a superposition of the zero and one state. And uh, if you would run this experiment, so in, if we in the composer add the Hadamard gate and then perform a measurement, you would notice that it will return in half of the cases, or approximately because of the errors, it will return the zero qubit, and in half it, be, it returns the one. What is important to, to get your mind around is that actually it's not either zero or one, but before you measure, the, the, the qubit is in some superposition state, which is a mixture between those two. And that will be important for, for many of the, the algorithms. Now, you can also um, create some others. So we have also this minus uh, cube, uh, qubit superposition state, which actually uh, you can obtain by using the Hadamard combined by this uh, Z gate. So that's actually a phase, this phase flip. 
Um, and the one thing to notice is when you measure, you will not be able to distinguish between this state and the previous one. Yeah? So it will give you exactly the same measurement. Yeah? Why? Because you're only measuring in one dimension, so you're not measuring that phase flip. So uh, how can you do that? You would need to add some additional gates to um, r rotate to another rotate actually your measurement and as such obtain um, the difference. So you would be able uh, to do measurements combined with gates, which will sh allow you to to see the difference between the plus and the minus state. And actually, with uh, there is some other gates, the phase gates, which allow you to create some more uh, uh, superposition uh, states. So those are, in fact, indicated by those circular representations in two directions. And again, uh, so there is the S and the um, corresponding um, uh, um, a gate which will allow you to uh, create those kind of states. And that will actually result in the fact that to distinguish between all those superimposed states which we have here, you would need to perform three kinds of measurements. And actually, we've solved that for you because we added this other measurement operator, which we call the block sphere representation, actually that will execute your experiment three times and will uh, perform the, the measurements along the three kind of um, um, superimposition uh, states. So, and, and that will show you that you can represent your qubit states by uh, this kind of mathematical function, which actually uh, means that there, th the state is somewhere on this uh, kind of uh, sphere, um, and you can measure those kind with those angles. You can get an idea about those phase flips uh, and all those kind of things. Yeah. So, so, so this will is is facilitating and will give you these kind of representations. Now. We see here a, a circuit which is an illustration of, of, of some of those things. So when you would execute this kind of circuit, so it, it again, remember all the, the qubits start in the zero state, and then you apply a number of those four mentioned uh, kind of gates, and each time you, uh, um, you perform this Bloch measurement on it, and you will see that you create those states which we call cardinal states because they are along those axes of the x, y, and z uh, of, of, of this block sphere. Yeah? And important to note also is that in an ideal system, always the, the, the qubits are on the, on the, on the sphere, so the, the length of this vector is always uh, 1. Now, what else do we need? In fact, in, in, in also in real computing, you need some contr controlled operation. So you want to do some if something then something else happens. Uh, and that will be possible with this uh, C not gate, uh, which actually will involve two qubits. It can be represented by this matrix. And in fact, it will uh, perform only the NOT operation in the case that the uh, control uh, qubit is in the state 1. And actually, here is a, a, an, uh, a table which shows what happens when you, uh, uh, when you use these kind of inputs to the C NOT gate, and then you measure and you see, for example, the 0, 0, it would remain 0, 0, because the control qubit is 0, and as such, the gate doesn't do anything. Those where the, 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 the first qubit is 1, then the, um, the, the gate would perform its operation and would perform a flip. And as such, you would see that, for example, the 1-1 one, one state would turn into a 1-0. Uh, yeah. Again, why is it not 1 and zeros? The reason is that it's being executed on a real quantum computer or on a simulator which takes into account the, the errors, and so you get some errors 
in your measurement. Now, one of the things which you can prove is that with those gates, all the gates which we mentioned before, you would be able to create any of the standard kind of logical gates. So you would be able to create AND, NAND, XOR, and all those kind of things, which is nice, which would mean that you can do a lot of things which you could also do with a regular um, computer, but that's of course not the purpose. So we need some additional gates which will allow us to reach also some other states. So we have, uh, you noticed that you have these um, other gates and we call them non-Clifford gates because they, they don't belong to this set which corresponds to the traditional operations and those will allow us to rotate in the um, in, the, in the block sphere and, and, and give us also some of the other results and allow us to do some interesting uh, kind of experiments. So that's the, the other gates, which you will also see in the, um, in, in, the, in, 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 in the composer. Now, if we start to look at some quantum algorithm, so how can you now do something with this? Yeah. The, the important thing to understand is that we want to try to make use of the, that superimposition because the superposition, sorry, because that will allow us to perform operations, a lot of operations at the same time. So a first kind of, oops, no, I don't want to. Uh, a first kind of op uh, algorithm is this Deutsch Yosa algorithm based on the names of the people who invented it. And it's actually not a very useful one, but it's a one which allows us to prove a lot of the basics that will be used in many algorithms. So what is it? It, in fact, starts from a, um, a preposition that we have a function uh, of x which either returns 0 or 1, so we are guaranteed that the outcome will always be 0 or 1, and the function will either be a constant or balanced, meaning that either it will return always zero or always one, so a constant outcome, or it will return zero for half of the values x and one for the other half. Yeah? So we know that. If um, and where where x is rep is representing an n bit kind of string. Now, if we if we execute, if we want try to evaluate that in a, a traditional way, what would we need to do? We would need to evaluate the the function f for uh, all those uh, for for a number of uh, values, and actually we would need to do it just for half plus one of the, the value. So it, depending of course on the size of the, uh, of your uh, byte, uh, it would uh, take more and more uh, evaluations. Now, what, what can we do? And, and then this is allowing us to explain the basis of, of, of this, of, of many of the quantum algorithms. In fact, in many of the quantum algorithms we will use a so-called oracle. This oracle will be represented here by a mathematical operation on our qubits, which actually will have as an outcome minus one uh, to the power to the power f x times x, and um, this will be the basis for many of the the algorithms. These kind of oracle circuits, and we will immediately see that we can easily implement those using some of the of the gates. Yeah. Now. What, what will we do to execute this in a much quicker way using a quantum computer? So remember, the qubits are initialized in the zero state. We will ap apply a Hadamard gate to each qubit, which will bring them in this superimposed state. And then we will apply this Oracle uh, circuit. Now, this is basically kind of applying the function to all the values of x in in one in one shot because we are applying it to those uh, qubits which are in the, that superimposed kind of uh, state yeah? and um, 
um, so the superimposed state is represented by this mathematical formula. So when you do the superimposition, we've noted that uh, there is all these, the probabilities of each of the states are equal. And then actually, if we apply the Oracle circuit, we will uh, get uh, this kind of value. Now, we will, what you will note is if we, uh, if the fx is a constant value, for example, zero, then it would sum up just all the, the, the vectors. If the fx would be balanced, so it would be, um, it would be zero or one for half of the values, then you would note that uh, those things are going to cancel each other out. Yeah. So if we go then, in fact, we can represent uh, those, um, uh, the, the, the oracle in the case of the, um, of the uh, balanced function with uh, this construction and in the case of the, um, of the in, in the other case, the constant, we note, for example, if we assume that the constant will be zero, that it will just map x on x. So if we don't do anything, we basically have a constant uh, function for our oracle. And if we look at the result, so what you will see is that if you execute this quantum circuit on, in the first case, you will get those different values. If we execute it in the uh, second case with the constant fu function, it will basically return uh, a 100% uh, pr uh, probability on the 0, 0, 0 uh, value in the case of three qubits in this case. So allowing us to, with one execution of such a quantum circuit, to immediately distinguish between those two things. Yeah. And so that's illustrating a basic kind of principle. Now, of course, that is not a very useful algorithm because it allows us only to make the difference between uh, a function which would be balanced or non-balanced. But very similar, you can, and, and this algorithm is called Grover's algorithm, again, based on the name of the person who uh, devised it. And basically, that would be one of the um, search algorithms in quantum computing. So if we assume we have like uh, n possible outcomes and only one is the one which we are searching for, in fact, if you would just do uh, a traditional search where you start to look at each of the values, you would on average have like n over two uh, um, evaluations to uh, figure out which is this uh, rat kind of value which we want to have. And it would, in the worst case, you would need n executions. Now we can show that with a quantum computing, again using the similar oracle as, as before, we would be able to uh, perform the same in a square root of n uh, times execution. So um, an, an imp a quadratic kind of improvement uh, in this. And given the fact that if we would be able to apply this with a, a large volume of cu qubits, this could mean uh, really some uh, good improvements in search functions, uh, which, of course, we all have to do in, in big data cases and all those kind of things. Now, again, it's using the Oracle function, the same one as we, we, um, we were before. But in this case, we um, will have a function of x which will be 0 for each of those and which will be 1 for uh, this one. Now, if we evaluate the oracle with that function, we will note that it performs a flip of this one value. In the case of when we are at that value, it will flip around. And actually, you can represent this in, in a graphical way. So if we look at uh, the Grover algorithm, you would be able to represent the vector representing the final outcome uh, as here. This would be the original superimposed state which we can obtain by applying a Hadamard gate on each of the qubits, where 
actually each of the possible values would have an equal chance. So here is the example of two, two qubits, so which allows us to represent four possible uh, values. Um, and each would be an equal outcome as long as we didn't execute anything uh, yet. Now, if you, what would happen if we apply the, the, the oracle on it, it would basically flip around uh, this, uh, one, for this one value, um, which uh, is of course allowing us to make some distinction. And then we can apply actually an additional transformation, which would turn around, the, the, would do a phase flip, and actually, the end result would be that we increase the probability of finding uh, the value, the, the correct value, and lower the probabilities on the others. And the mathematics allow us to prove that uh, this, if you perform this um, square n times, you would be able uh, to have a, um, a, a one probability for the, the value you're searching for. And now, um, here is an example of how you could implement that algorithm. Um, so you can find them back um, on the, um, in, 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 the, uh, in, in, in the in the guide. In fact, if we execute that, and I will quickly do it because the time is running out. So actually, this is executing the Grover algorithm for um, a, a two-qubit uh, computer, so allowing us to um, uh, to 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 uh, show uh, to 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 distinguish four different kind of states. And actually, in this case, the implementation of the oracle. So we first have the Adam Adam gates. Then we have the, the oracle. This oracle will basically uh, be the one for uh, filtering out this, this one, uh, zero, 01 function. So it, the, the function would flip uh, at that value. And we see that even with one execution, in the case of the two qubits and only four values, we get already uh, a 0.8%, uh, or I'm sorry, 0 0.8 probability uh, on, on the 0, 01, which is the value we, which we are uh, searching for. So unfortunately, uh, the time uh, has run out. Um, so um, a few more, few more things before I, I let you go. Uh, so there is also a few things in, in my uh, presentation on the uh, what's happening with the error correction. We saw those times. In fact, what is happening? It's basically when you put a qubit in the one state. This time is showing you how long it takes before it will start to decay to zero. So you see, this is very small amounts of time, uh, and the t2 time, which we see here, is the dephasing. So if you perform a phase ro um, uh, rotation, uh, the, 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 that will go away after uh, these kind of times. Now, the important thing is that this is a factor which we have been improving over time. So um, this is where we were like 1999. And this is where we are now with the, the current implementation, which starts to make it, make it really usable. So um, that was, in fact, the overview. Of course, there is lots and lots of more that can be told about it. There is lots and lots of more experiment algorithms that you can evaluate. And that's why I've included all this reference, reference information. So there is the links towards um, the quantum experience itself. There is an example where a university, the University of Barcelona, used this five qubit computer to uh, perform some to, to, to perform some experiments for a, a doctorate research paper. Um, and then there is a number of books which I find really very inspiring. So there is uh, these which are 
specifically about quantum computing. And then there is a, a fairly old book, but be, um, actually uh, written or based on the lectures of the uh, originator of quantum computing, Richard Feynman. So that's if you want to know more about quantum physics and all the maths behind it, etc. And then there is a lot of information, all kinds of links, uh, IBM videos, uh, there is a lot of articles, both IBM and non-IBM, which I uh, mention here. So you will be able, if it's really of your interest, and, and I hope my talk at least gave you a little bit of a feeling of what quantum computing is and what you can uh, start to do with it, uh, will give you a lot of more information uh, to, 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 to study more. Um, um, and there is also some of our researchers, which you could follow on Twitter, uh, who po uh, post all kinds of funny things. Uh, also, for example, here you can see uh, an experiment about quantum chess, where actually also your chess pieces can be on multiple places at the same time and those kind of things. So uh, <laughs> there is some also uh, funny things, but the purpose, of course, is to uh, explain you some of those things which are very uh, abstract. So that was what I wanted to present. Um, as said, there is still a lot more that can be done, but I will still be around on the conference and you have all the reference information uh, to find more.